Hi everyone, good to see you today. Welcome to uh, the Philosophical Geometry class. I'm gonna go ahead and put this down so you can see what we're looking at today. Let's see if we can get this, whoops. Better frame here. Okay, hopefully you guys can still see that. Perfect, okay. So um, I've had a lot of questions lately about vortex-based mathematics and I wanted to go ahead and address this issue because I think a lot of people think that I don't uh, follow or know vortex-based vortex mathematics. Um, I definitely do and it's one of the things that um, is part of the precursors, I guess, to the class because it's, it's a very basic understanding but I figured, hey, some people might not know it at all so I'm going to go ahead and teach some of the principles of vortex-based mathematics today. Uh, just the very simple, the very simple stuff. So what we have here is a spiral. And this spiral is, uh, is kind of a special spiral because it relates to Fibonacci numbers. Now, Fibonacci numbers, you may know, are numbers that are self-generating number patterns. So, for example, a Fibonacci sequence would start with one. You add one to it and um, it becomes two. And then you add that number and the last number. So it becomes two plus one equals three. And then three plus two equals five. And then three plus five equals eight. And then five plus eight equals 13. So the Fibonacci number sequence then goes one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144. So the 12th number in the sequence is 144, and that's easy to remember because it's 12 squared, right? So 12 times 12 is 144. Well, there's other ways also to look at the numbers in this self-generating pattern context, and uh, another number series is called the Lucas numbers. Now, one thing that's really important to note about this is that these numbers tend to have this also very special characteristic that I'll just review really quick, which is this one right here. So these are the Fibonacci numbers. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377, 610, 987, 1597. Now what's interesting about this is that these numbers give us the golden mean, right? So you can, you can use your phi calipers on this to, to calculate it, it's one way to do it. Or you can also just simply take, you know, a number like 89, right? And divide it into 144 and it will equal 0.618. And then you could take 144, divide that by 89 and it will equal 1.618. So this is very unique because phi is the only number that has you know, one separating it in the front and then all infinite digits on the other side of its one over X reciprocal value are the same. So phi is 1.618033988878. It just keeps going, going and going. And its one over X value is likewise 0.618033988878. It's identical. The only difference is there's no one in the front. And we often call that little phi. Um, we call, uh, so little phi is 0.618 zero uh point six one eight zero three three nine eight eight seven and big phi is one point six one eight zero three three nine eight eight seven so pretty simple right now but there's other ways to look at these numbers uh but fibonacci numbers are fundamentally important because all life everything dna dna everything is based off of it so but back to this what this basically is doing is it's giving us fibonacci numbers in this sequence here right up here, and I'll try to move this so both sides can see this. So Fibonacci numbers, uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144. But Lucas numbers are similar, except that they start with the number two. So it becomes two plus one, plus three, plus four, plus seven, right? Sorry, two plus one equals three, one plus three equals four, three plus four equals seven, four plus seven equals 11, 7 plus 11 equals 18, 11 plus 18 equals 29, and then 47, 76, 123, 199. Now what's interesting is the further along you get in this sequence, you'll find that these numbers also 
If I take 123 divided by 199, it's going to also equal close to 1.618. And all these numbers will conform eventually to 1.618, the same irrational type phi number. So uh, my publishing partner, Talal, had written a book, and in his book he talks about another number series, which starts with three, which he analyzed, and it comes out to three plus one equals four, one plus four equals five, four plus five equals nine, five plus nine equals, uh, equals 14, nine plus 14 equals 23, and 37, 60, 97. And again, the same phenomenon happens. Now what's interesting about this, though, is that when you put these numbers around you'll notice that this, this pattern comes out when you sum those three series together, and it comes out to this number series of 6, 3, 9, 3, 3, 6, 9, 6, 6, 3, 9, 3, 3, 6, 9, 6, 6, 3, 9, 3, 3, 6, 9, 6, 6. And that turns out to be kind of one of the foundations of vortex-based mathematics. So what this is doing is it's kind of creating vortex of number series that are creating this toroidal sort of shape. And here's this combination, Fibonacci, Lucas, and Tal sum, six, three, nine, three, three, six, nine, six, six, three, nine, three, three, six, nine. Now you might know that Tesla said, all the secrets of the universe are in the numbers three, six, and nine. And when you use digital root mathematics, it becomes uh, very evident that nine plays a very special role and so does three and six. So what does this actually mean though, as far as like the world around us? You know, what is this Taurus doing? Well, it's basically creating what I like to call electromagneto gravitation. So basically the universe only has one force. This idea that there are different forces in the universe, with all due respect to the scientific community, the universe has only one force and it's electricity and it's polarity and that polarity of electricity creates all other forces as a result of it. So they emerge simultaneous, but there is a result of that, that interchange, that rhythmic balanced interchange. And this is very well explained by Walter Russell. Um, and it would be great when the scientific community will be able to fully comprehend what he has basically put in all of his books. But even Nikola Tesla, after having read his books, and he was a close partner and friend of, uh, of Walter Russell, said to Walter that he needed to hide his books away for over a thousand years because the world wasn't ready for his technology and his understanding of, of the simplicity and beauty of mathematics as well as uh, the relationship to geometry and that gravity and radiation are simply equal opposite conditions of the same phenomenon of electricity. So with electricity, we have charge polarity, right? That's already coming as a result of, of just the two charge separations that have, but it also perpetuates that charge polarity. And we have a North Pole, a South Pole, we have an East and a West. And with that, you have, um, coming off of this, you also have light from radiation that emerges. And you also have darkness from, from uh, gravitation that also emerges. Now, each of the numbers that we have in our base nine system which actually, in the future lesson, you'll learn that actually we should have a base 12 system, but never mind that for a moment. But the numbers that we have in the base 9 system, or the base 10 system, or mod 9 system, is each one of them is relational to a different particle within physics, and then those scale at all scales of the universe. So every time we find a new thing, we're not really finding a new thing, we're just finding a new scale of the same thing. And it always comes down to triplets. It always comes down to these kinds of triplets and balance. So you've got a positive charge, a negative charge, and a neutral charge. So we have a proton, right, that is in spin. And we have mass that's coming off of that. We have, just like we have magnetism and electricity that are at opposite, you know, 90 degree offsets of each other as poles, we have the same thing. Uh, related to uh, what I would say on the other side of a mirror, which is kind of like the, the opposite poles of magnetism and electricity. So there's a positive pole of electricity, there's a negative pole of electricity. The negative pole of electricity, for example, is the number seven. The positive pole of electricity is the number two. The positive pole of magnetism is the number four, and the negative pole of magnetism is the number five. And that's why two and five, which are the positive and the negative, so respectively of electricity and magnetism, work so beautifully together. 
right? So 2 and 5, and 1 over 2 equals 0.5, and 1 over 5 equals 0.2. So these numbers are irre you know, irre irrevocably sort of linked, or they're inextricably linked together. And off of this comes radiation and gravity, which creates time and energy. And time is just the opposite of energy. You could basically say it like that. Energy becomes like potentiality, and time is the space or the darkness. We think that it's dark and that there's nothing inside of the space or the vacuum, but actually you can tap into the vacuum just like Nikola Tesla talked about. And understanding this kind of vortex-based mathematics at an even higher level, because the stuff that is, is taught, while I think it's great as, a, as sort of an introductory course, uh, it stops way too early and it doesn't go further in the analysis, um, unfortunately. So what, what I did was I took this a little bit further and a lot of people ask about the solfeggio frequencies and the solfeggio frequencies don't actually sound great when you play them. Um, so I'm not a fan of using the solfeggio frequencies from the perspective of music, but they do play a, a very, very important role in delineating out these triplets. So, and each one of them has different meanings, right? And this is a, a form that I found that uh, basically is a, is, a, is a nonogram, so nine-pointed star. And within this, we have uh, the different triplets all showing their different permutations. So, for example, the 285 triplet, 852 and 528, all have different purposes that they're basically creation, creating, right? So photon, electron, magnetism, neutron, electron, proton for 369, 963, uh, 396, excuse me, and 639. And then dark magnetism, a gravitation, and, uh, and dark electric, right? So this is basically 174, 417, and 741. So there are numbers that the way the universe basically uses all of this to coordinate on top of circles and squares, just like, you know, the simplicity of design that we see. And this combination of one, four, and seven uh, is related to gravitation. Two, five, and eight is directly related to radiation, which is electromagnetism as we know it, and motion. Now, we have this big chasm between the standard model of physics and the quantum model of physics. And a lot of it is based on the fact that we didn't get the right information from James Clerk Maxwell, who uh, published all of this, or actually was published after he died by another fellow by the name of Oliver Heaviside, who very heavy-handedly took out a lot of his mathematics on quaternions, which showed that electricity was actually creating gravity. Um, and when Oliver Heaviside didn't understand the quaternion mathematics, he just excluded gravitation from all of the, the publication work. So that led to the schism today that we don't even have an understanding that gravity and electricity are linked and, and, and related. And of course, Einstein tried to figure that one out for a long time and he was never able to really come to terms with it. Now, when I discovered the prime number pattern, the reason why I was working on the prime number pattern was because I was trying to find the link between gravity and radiation. And what I had also noticed was that every 24 numbers, the Fibonacci numbers had repeated. Now there were other people that noticed this um, and I didn't learn it from them. I basically kind of learned it just through my own uh, work. Um, and, but the people that really had a heavy influence on this uh, with me would have been people like Peter Plichta. Uh, and then, you know, I'd already seen it, but I had, saw, I had seen also online that, uh, that my good friend Jane had done a lot of work on this as well, on the number 24 in particular, and he even made a website of it and everything, and I was thrilled when I saw it because, you know, the way I see all of this is this is universal. Um, I don't own this, nobody owns this. It's, it's not like a, it's, a, it's a universal type ownership thing. And when, when people are able to open their eyes and see it because of their own curiosity first and foremost, and then secondly, when they're able to, to experience it because they're really trying to understand the universe and tap into the creation of the universe, then it's a, just a beautiful thing. And so I have such deep respect for uh, so many of these different colleagues that have, have had played a, a major role on this. And I, I wanna thank uh, Jane in particular, who's done a wonderful job. And if you haven't seen his courses and stuff, his work is excellent. He also does a lot of stuff on, uh, on Instagram too. And uh, they're just fantastic people as well. So 
But anyway, what I was trying to find was this link between gravity and radiation, and, and it's one of the things that Nassim had been working on, and so I was very interested to, to try to figure it out. And that's when I basically came up with this look at the prime numbers, and Plicta had already put the prime numbers in a chart similar to this, but he'd never delineated out what the other numbers that weren't prime were actually doing. And what I was looking for was more the mathematical constants. And I found in direct relationships to 360 degrees and 432 degrees, all the math constants emerge out of the middles of this cross. So for example, you know, you'll see 222. Well, for someone like me, I see 222. That's not just an angel number. It's actually phi. It's little phi, 0. 0.618 times 360 equals 222, right? And each one of these has a different role. When I see 198, I'm seeing, okay, that's 360 degrees minus 162, which is also phi. It's very close to 1618. And of course, we have to look at the closest numbers here in whole numbers because this 24-hour clock is only looking at whole numbers. So the other thing I noticed was that this 24-hour clock, when you look at everything in digital root, which is simply adding the number within itself, you'll find that all of these rows will have only certain numbers expressing in digital root. You know, for example, so I start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then I start getting to above 10 and 11 becomes the number two because one plus one is two. 12 equals, uh, equals three, 13 equals four, one plus four equals five. So it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it just sort of repeats on itself. Now, I'd already mentioned before that the 24-hour clock was important for many reasons, and, and one of them also is that even the Earth's uh, radius is 3,960 miles, and the sum of angles of a 24-sided polygon is also 3,960. And it's interesting that we have 24 hours in a day, so that's kind of amazing, right? And that 396 is matching again, 396, right? There's that Tesla number again. So basically what you'll find here is that if I take all these numbers out and just keep expanding these circles by 24 all the way around, so then this row goes one to 25, and then, and then it goes to 49, and then you know it just keeps coming, going up all the way up, right? Just by adding 24. And what you'll notice is that the pattern that comes out of this is the number one, seven, four, 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 infinitely. And the middles of each of these cross points will always come out to digital roots of three, six, or nine, without exception. So there's something with 24 that does this, and so does the flower of life, by the way. So on the second row, I've got two, eight, five, two, eight, five, two, eight, five, two, eight, five, two, eight, five. So here's the two, eight, five row. And then if I look at its mirrored opposite row, it's gonna be five, two, eight. Isn't that interesting? So basically it's creating its own sort of palindromicity or permutation at a 180 degree axis. Hmm. So three, nine, six here does the same thing to six, three, nine. And not only there, but I could actually form like a rectangle out of this. So three, nine, six, mirrors up to three, nine, six over here, which marries up to three, to six, three, nine over here, and nine, six, three over here. So I started noticing that there's like this quaternion, or quaternity, that's matching up across this entire page. And, and that to me was fascinating. Knowing also from Talal's work that, that uh, gravity was relational to the numbers one, four, and seven, and that electromagnetism was two, five, and eight. And I had found that, you know, if you simply take, um, you know, the the uh, the square root, right, of uh, of let's see, what was it again? So, oh, that's right. So, two hundred and fifty-eight degrees, right, is going to give me exactly 0.714 of three hundred and sixty which basically is giving me this weird uh, reciprocity again. And that reciprocity is telling me 258 is electromagnetism, but when I look at it as a decimal against the degrees, it's giving me gravity, 
That's pretty fascinating. Now, 258 two, squared is also coming out to exactly the gravitational constant. It gives me 6.67408 is the gravitational constant. So, wait a minute. There is this relationship between gravity and electromagnetism, right? So, electromagnetism being the 258 combination of numbers, I square it and I'm getting the gravitational constant? Wow. Okay. So, and all of this, of course, relates to musical notes, like we talked about last time. And, and this is where this number series becomes really important of the one over seven and, and also the doubling math. And, and so um, I'll save this till next time because it's kind of more advanced, but basically it's talking about how the electromagnetic pump works to create our entire universe and this holographic style projection that we have. So what I've done here is I've taken these same concepts right, on this page, and I basically said, okay, I'm gonna draw, and, and, and we're all gonna to learn today how to draw a 24-sided polygon perfectly, um, and I'm gonna show you how to do this, uh, and you'll also see how to make these kind of lotus flowers, which are also kind of interesting. But what I did here is I took the, the digital roots of the Fibonacci numbers going around, and I created 24 points around this, and you'll see here that, you know, one plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, three plus five equals eight, five plus eight equals 13. So I've now used the digital root of four, right? So this is the language you guys are all gonna learn. And then it goes 21, 34, right? Three plus four equals seven, 55, 89, 144. So now I'm right at that axis point, right, on, on 24. And 24 has so many very important properties associated with it. Now what I also did is I, I noticed as well, and, and so did Jane and so did many other people as well, that the opposite numbers across the 180 degree axis here will always sum to the number nine. So in fact, it makes it easy to do this because I don't have to calculate out all these numbers. I know that it'll be perfect because I've done it many, many times. So I just carry this around. This will always follow the same pattern that will repeat every 24 digits. So then one plus eight must equal nine. And one plus eight equals nine. Two plus seven equals nine. Three plus six, five plus four, eight plus one, four plus five, right? Three plus six, seven, plus two and one plus eight and eight plus one. And then nine plus nine equals 18, which is back to nine. It's funny, I was just watching, uh, some guy wrote this thing or did this, um, it was kind of a mathematician fellow uh, who wanted to debunk the notion of vortex-based mathematics. I think he, for some reason, had some visceral reaction to it. He was actually quite polite about it, but he was trying to debunk it by showing his knowledge of modular arithmetic. But Unfortunately, in the process of trying to debunk it, he actually kind of proved it, at least I thought. I was gonna write a comment to him and say, you kind of actually proved what you were trying to debunk. Um, and he was only looking at modular arithmetic. Well, I'm gonna take this analysis to another level in a moment, you're gonna see why uh, vortex-based mathematics is actually right. It's, it's basic, but it's, it's very good stuff. So this next one is the Lucas numbers. So Lucas numbers, and Lucas numbers were discovered, and I think they were around the, I want to say 14th century, uh, by this guy named Lucas. And so basically, you take two, you add it to one, and then three, and then four, and then seven, and then this will come out to the same 1.618 eventually uh, ratios. And then I have the Talal numbers, and I just keep adding another one. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, and then going around the circle. And what's interesting, you'll always end up, because the patterns always repeat at 24, even with these numbers, you'll always end up with exactly the mirrored opposite, even starting with the number five as my first Fibonacci you know, sequence number here, and then five, one, and then five plus one equals six, etc. I'm still gonna end up with exact mirror opposites that add up and sum to the number nine without exception. So this will always come up to the number nine. And that pattern that I showed you earlier of the three, six, nine, nine, three, three, nine, whatever, uh, repeating pattern is something that you're gonna see over and over and over again. Now, what you'll notice here is that this also reveals some other patterns. You'll see that the second position is always ones, 
on this type of uh, analysis. You'll also see that this pattern uh, you know, in the third position is, is gonna be kind of like two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it'll just keep repeating, right? And you'll see something similar as well in the fourth position, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you'll see something different with five. So it kind of goes five, seven, nine, two, four, which doesn't seem to have a lot of pattern if you just look at it at first glance. You'll see that the, the equator on this has, uh, on the east-west axis, has five, two, eight, five, two, eight, and that's gonna go infinitely. Hmm. And you'll notice also that, the, that the, there's an oscillating pattern for three and six. And the reason why three and six is oscillating because if you just take three and you double it, you're gonna get six. And if you double that again, it comes to 12. And if you double that again, it comes to 24. And the digital roots then alternate between three, six, three, six, three, six, infinitely. And the same thing happens with six. So nine serves as like an anchor and it has a positive and negative polarity. That means it's neutral, right? Just like a neutron is. Three is a negative polarity. Six is a positive polarity. Six is positive. And then you've got negative. So everything kind of stays in balance, right? You've got across this mirror, the same type of a thing. And then you've seen radiation coming out here and gravity coming out on the other side. And this is, this is basic kind of information theory analysis that we're trying to look at in this case, using modular arithmetic to be able to do it. But let's take it to another level. So for those people that, that don't accept that, you know, the number two and five are mirrored opposites each other, not only because they look like the same number, it's just one is upside down backwards of the other, and then number four and seven do the same kind of thing, for those people that don't just accept that, right? Even though I might say, okay, one over two equals 0.5. So whoever made our number system was a freaking genius, right? And one over four equals 0.25, but two plus five equals seven, right? So obviously there's some parity going on here. And the way that I really came to the conclusion that there were absolutely is some pattern here it has nothing to do with, with just modular arithmetic uh, and I mean, first of all, the people that fight against this are the ones that say, oh, we could have had any kind of number system. It could have been hexadecimal. It could have been all kinds of other number systems. Well, but we don't. <laughs> we, have a, we have a base nine or, or mod nine system that we use for a reason, right? And because it's universal and it's, it's there, right? Now, it can also morph naturally into a mod 12, which will be a subject of another, of another lesson where and what I'm saying is that actually we should have in the next dimensional frame, there will be three new numbers. And with each next dimension, you get three new single digit numbers. Now, try to swallow that one for a few minutes and I'll leave that for another lesson. But what I've done here is I've basically taken X to different powers. So this is the line of X. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you've got one. So one to all its powers is only ever gonna yield one. That's kind of a no-brainer. So two times two equals four. And then the digital roots are the large numbers and the small numbers are the actual products. So two times two times two equals eight. Two to the third power. Two to the fourth power is 16, but one plus six equals seven. Two to the fifth power is 32. And that's easy to remember because three plus two equals five. So two to the fifth power, gonna give you a digital root of five. And then um, two to the sixth power gives us back at a digital root of one. And so this pattern goes four, eight, seven, five, one, two, four, eight, seven, five, one, right? Now the number three will only ever give us three times three equals nine, three times three times three equals 27, 81, 243, 729. So all these numbers have digital roots of nine. Now let's take four, right? Four times four equals 16, one plus six equals seven, and then 64, 256. So you now have a pattern of 714, 714, 714 infinitely. And five does something interesting because it's 25, five times five, and that equals seven. So then five times five times five is 125, that equals eight. So that goes seven, eight, four, two, one, five, seven, eight, four, two, one. 
And then seven is giving me kind of the opposite of what four did. It's giving me four, one, seven, four, one, seven, four, one, seven. And then eight is giving me only ones and eights, and nine is giving me only nines. Okay, so we can basically take out for this analysis three, six, and nine because they're always coming out to nine, which is kind of bizarre. And there's no threes and sixes that get created out of this, right? Now, if you kind of look at the patterns here, what are the patterns that we can see? The patterns that we see here, I'm trying to see this so that people can see it, okay? Patterns that we see here are that two and five are not only look, looking the same and that they are upside down backwards opposites of the same number, like mirrored opposites, um, orthogonally, right, of each other, but their powers are also acting orthogonally to each other. So we have a pattern for two, which is two doubles four, four, eight, seven, five, one, two, four, eight, seven, five, one, two, four, eight, seven, five. And the pattern for five is seven, eight, four, two, one, five, seven, eight, four, two, one, exactly mirrored opposite, just backwards. So now grant, I, you can grant me this, that, okay, it could be that the shapes are just the same and that's just a coincidence. But then the one over X values coming out to the same value, okay, that's probably a little bit more than coincidence, but okay, maybe it's coincidence. But now all of their powers are creating mirrored opposite reflections of each other. I'd say two and five are the same number, in fact. They're just mirror reflections of each other. Again, I talked last time about looking at a number in a non-duality sense. So the way to look at the number right, five, is to look at it as a number two. You've just got one side of it that is absorbed versus it's reflected. And we should actually be looking at the whole thing, right? That's how we should be looking at it. Whenever we see the number two, we should also likewise see five. And anytime you double something, you're also having it somewhere because there has to be an equal opposite reaction for everything in the universe. And the same is also true with four and seven because seven, one, four, seven, one, four, seven, one, four is a pattern for four and four, one, seven, four, one, seven, four, one, seven is a pattern for seven. This is at all powers infinitely. So what this basically leads to is to look differently at numbers, which is we've got a discrete value and a continuous value. And in some cases we have discrete, discrete, like two and five are discrete, discrete. But seven has this very, very unique role. And, and it's because... You know, you could take 360 degrees, right? And I'm gonna divide that by 12, right? And you can kind of go down this, you know, down this path, you know, of, of uh, even numbers, right? And eight and seven, six, you know, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now, what happens is 11 and seven act very strange. <laughs> Why? Because if I break 360 into 12 pieces, it gives me 30 degree arcs, right? If I break it into 11 pieces, it gives me 32.72, right, 72 degrees. If I break it into 10, it gives me 36 degrees. If I break it into nine, it gives me 40 degrees. If I break it into eight, it's gonna give me 45 degrees. If I break it into seven, it gives me 51.4285714. Seven one four, and it gives me this weird, you know, infinite thing. So seven and eleven are the only ones that do that kind of weird deal, right? If I break three sixty into six, it's giving me, of course, sixty degrees, right? If I break it into five, it gives me seventy two degrees. If I break it into four, it gives me ninety. If I break it into three, it's one twenty. If I break it into two, it's giving me 180, right? And then this is just 360. So, I mean, I could say that this is a square, right? Or a circle, you could say, right? Because it's a sum of angles. But let's just say that, let's take the square out of it for, for this purpose, because we're going to look at these values, arc values. So this would be what's called a digon. You know, I'd say, what is that, right? A digon. It's basically two lines, but do not close up as a polygon. Then you have a triangle here, and this is an equilateral triangle. Then you have a true square, right? Because 90 degrees of arc is its side. 
72 is going to give you a pentagon. 60 is going to give us a hexagon. This gives us a heptagon. And it gives us these irrational sides. That's why heptagons are very difficult to deal with. And then you've got an octagon, right? A nonagon, a decagon, and you've got a hendecagon, which is 11 sides, and then a dodecagon. So that's polygonal geometry for you right there. And seven and 11 are creating kind of these portals or something. There, there's something very unique about these numbers because of the, the tails that they create, this repeating rational tail. Another thing I noticed is that when you take, you know, one over seven, it gives you this pattern of 0 0.1428571428574. .1 and when I use doubling math on it, it goes one doubles two, two doubles four, four doubles eight, eight doubles to, uh, to 16, which is seven, seven doubles 32, which is five, five doubles to 10, which is one again. And this looks kind of like a DNA pattern to me. Now, if you add up all of those numbers in this period of six digits, one, four, two, eight, five, seven, all add up to 27, which is related to phi, right? So um, you basically take uh, 72 is its mirror reflection. So 27, 72, 72 is the degree reference for the pentagon, right? So the first angle around a circle this point right here is gonna be at 72 degrees on a circle of this is zero, okay? So this has some absorption value that relates to phi, right? And that's why I say it's, you know, relational to phi. And, 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 and that is a very, very important number. We'll come back to this. It also relates to four over pi. Four over pi equals 1.273, which is why the menstrual cycle is 27.3 days. This is why the, the moon cycle is exactly what it is. It's four over pi relationship. So, but the one over X of 27 gives me 37, oh, 37, oh, 37, and 37 times 3.7 gives me one over alpha or the alpha number, which is 0 0.0073. And then you have this other unique thing coming out where you got 137 and 73. So that's a palindrome relationship right, the very near palindrome for 37 and 73. Now, what this does is it creates this electromagnetic pump that works just like DNA. And, and this DNA is creating all these different numbers that have different characteristics. I spoke last time that one equals dark and it's gravity. Two equals Electric, so it's the positive pull of electric. Three equals electron. So now we're starting to deal with matter, and it's a negative charge. Four is a positive charge, and it is the positive charge of magnetism. Five is the, um, is the negative charge of magnetism. Six is the proton, which is a positive charge. Seven is the negative charge of electricity. Eight equals the photon of light, which is positive. And nine, just like zero, right, acts like zero, is the neutron. And it has a neutral charge. And this pattern just repeats over and over and over again. And this pattern of seven, the number seven, and creating all the different iterations of, you know, one, two, four, eight, seven, five, one, and then it's five to the n version, which is eight, seven, five, one, two, four, eight, right? It's creating DNA. And from this, you're getting protons and electrons, protons and electrons and neutrons. Um, and we've done a lot of research on this now. And uh, we're about to publish a paper on DNA, in fact, and how the combinations of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine in DNA are actually just digital root mathematics. If you simply add up the number of electrons in the molecular bonds of uh, adenine plus thymine and guanine plus cytosine, 
along with the phosphate backbone, they will always add up to digital roots of nine until you go into transfer RNA and, and then simply uh, when you go to transfer RNA, the uracil is replacing the thymine in the adenine-thymine combination and it then gives you an offset value where the value becomes zero. I'll teach you that in another lesson. And so literally DNA becomes a binary code. I, I don't mean becomes a binary, it literally is a binary code. 100%, the same computer language that we use today in binary. But this 24, and there's a reason why 24 is so important. Um, you know, 24 is such a critical number. And then with its mirrored opposite pairs, you're gonna get all combinations, right? So these numbers are all gonna be special numbers. So 24 then can, of course, transmute, four can transmute into seven, two can transmute into five, right? Two can also flip with seven, and four can also flip with five because these two add up to nine. So that means that 24 is an important number. 42 is an important number, which also happens to be the reciprocal value of 42. Not only is it a palindrome, which is the backwards version, it's also the reciprocal value. So it's one over 24 equals 0.4166666 repeating, that rounds to 42. And 57 does the same thing. One over 57 gives me 175. So these numbers that have this characteristic of both reciprocity and palindromicity are, are kind of like playing, playing a very, very important role. You know, 57, for example, degrees, 57.29 degrees equals one radian. We know the golden angle is 137.5 degrees. So 2.4 times one radian equals the golden angle. Hmm, okay. So all of this is fundamental to understanding vortex-based mathematics and how this all works to come together to form the universe around us um, that is really, in my opinion, a, like, uh, a mathematical reflection of consciousness. People ask me what, what geometry is, and I say that's consciousness right away. They ask me all the time also, what, you know, what is a number? And I say it's a fractal of consciousness <laughs> with an entire universe within itself. And certain numbers, I mean, if you just look at everything as divided from the number one originally, because there was only one that everything came out from, um, everything else is just sort of like one over X or X over one. And, and that becomes like the experience around us. Now, another thing you notice about this lotus shape that comes out of this is it starts to look really three-dimensional, like I'm looking at a sphere, right? So let's learn how to draw this really quick. And um, let's see here, go to the new page. Now let's start with our line. So you guys just took in a lot of information and knowledge. If you're interested to learn more, um, recommend you taking my course uh, or just reading published papers that we've done on this kind of work. And I highly recommend the book by Talal Guanam to understand a lot of this work too, um, called The Mystery of Numbers. There's also another book that covers many of these topics uh, called Cosmometry uh, by my friend and colleague Marshall Lefferts and another book that is... Um, uh, that is called The Numerical Universe by Anthony Morris, another friend of mine based in the UK. So we have our, let's start by drawing a simple kind of uh, flower of life. And, and let's go ahead and pick the size, make sure I do this right. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick the same size that I did over here. Okay, there we go. I think the key to understanding this kind of work, first and foremost, is curiosity. Once you care about it, somehow your consciousness will find a way for you to be able to find and understand it, as it were. Thank you. 
is right. Okay. Up and down. There's a number of ways you can come at this, but actually one way that you can do it is just like just like this. Somebody, that, a friend of mine on Instagram asked me to draw this today because they really wanted to learn how to draw it. So here we are. Kind of like being a DJ, getting a request <laughs> for music. Okay. So now, right, we can, we can take this and... Uh, we can expand this to draw a circle all the way around it if we like. And make sure that touches each point. There we go, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and, and give me some intersections here of, uh, so I'll go ahead and draw some lines. Now let's go ahead and draw some lines that are gonna split those as well. So the way you do that is you just simply intersect this point, the center, and try to line up the bottom one too so you get both of them at the same time. A little trick also, if it's not totally perfect, you can kind of like lean your pencil one way or the other to, to have it so the line doesn't have to go perfectly straight and it will end up intersecting both lines. But it'll be totally imperceptible to somebody else. Okay. So now we're going to take this, we're going back to our normal size here. We're going to go ahead and intersect this one at the halfway point. Just like that. See? That was not so difficult. So we've got one here. We don't have one here. I went a little bit out of bounds on that. And the way that's kind of easy to check this is to see if you don't have an apex right right up against the, if you don't have a, a, a circle right up at the top here, then that's where you're gonna go. So I have one here, so I'm not gonna go there. So I'll go in here next. Okay, so now, that's pretty cool. We can go to the next level, because this is all kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So we made 12. Now we wanna go to the 24, 
we're gonna have to go like this. So then this is gonna give me a circle with a, what's called an Icasi tetragon. 24 sided polygon that I can draw within it now. Now you see what I just did? It's like bending the bullet in those movies, you know? Basically, by just going back and forth, I was able to intersect the center point and still get really, really close to the lines, right? That's kind of a, a cheat way to do it, but it works. Last time, we talked about overcoming scarcity and fear. I got many emails and letters and everything that were very inspirational and heartwarming on how people are starting to uh, experience what we've been talking about, which is a higher consciousness just through the drawing. And I got to use it, some of those, in a conversation I had with my colleague, Alan Green, who is very much oriented on, you know, constantly using computers. He loves to, to use his computer for everything. And I encouraged him yesterday to really start drawing because, you know, I've used my computer too, but and you just don't get the, I don't know, you just don't get the benefit in consciousness. So now I'm gonna to go to these lines that don't have, where the circle is not touching any one of the larger circle points. So then we take the same thing. Just like that. Okay, here's the next one. People ask me all the time, also, what I think about conspiracies. <laughs> and there are definitely a lot going around right now. Um, and I guess it's not that I don't believe there aren't bad things that happen in the world. I definitely know that. But um, again, that's just anchoring me to another duality perspective, which... I'm trying to get out of duality. So the more I try to focus on things like conspiracy theories, that people are trying to hold me back and everything, it's just when I know actually I have total control over my experience, it's just part of the part of me that is resisting leaving this sort of world or this sort of experience of perception. So when I hear about conspiracy theories, I'm not really thinking about what the other people are doing to me as much as I'm thinking, why is it that my, my own experience is bringing this into my consciousness? You know, what's, what's, what am I still not truly believing? 
So I see it more as a reflection of, of my own experience and than anything else. So I don't usually engage that much in kind of talking about the conspiracy stuff because I, it's just a reminder that <laughs> there's another part of my personality that I still need to resolve. Okay, so now we have 24, right? So we have a circle at each one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, 23, 24. And one of the things I like to do with this as well is to, to take each of the points where, this is one of the things Da Vinci did, you'll see in his art of geometry. which I've been working really hard on that whole thing on Da Vinci with Alan, and it's epic. I cannot wait to share it with you guys. And we're actually making new films and everything and very excited about it. So if you can see here where this like petal is like overlapping, let's just draw another circle here. And we could do it again here. We can go all the way out. And you could fill this whole thing up just like a rodent coil. For those people that are into vortex mathematics. And um, I like it. I just think it it's kind of like um, very basic. I was drawing this in my living room and my daughter looked at it and she said, Daddy, that's beautiful. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a great weekend. All the best.